uh, this is uh, lecture number 31. In this lecture, we will be talking about reinforced soil retaining walls. Uh, in fact, this is one of the biggest contributions of reinforced soil uh, because of which you are able to construct uh, many retaining walls made of this uh, reinforced soil. This has uh, significantly contributed to uh, infrastructure construction. Uh, the way that the reinforced soil evolved, we have already seen and its applications to reinforced soil walls or the retaining walls is something that is very unique and uh, in fact, this is the one that we had in a classical uh, retaining walls in which uh, say for example, you call the gravity retaining walls in which uh, the weight of the soil uh, exerts some sort of uh, lateral pressure component. And you, by the weight of this soil alone, the retaining, uh, the retaining structure, you try to resist the horizontal force. So that is a concept of a gravity wall in which the weight of the so the retaining system, um, and it's uh, you try to have some geometrical proportions in such a way that uh, the uh, it, it 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 will have it will withstand all the pressures, both lateral pressures and the vertical components of pressures. Uh, so we design this, and in fact, sometimes when this is required. We try to provide shear keys also to increase the shear resistance because when there is a lateral force acting, uh, they, there should be some sort of resistance that needs to be provided. Either it can be a shear keys here and it can be even at the bottom sometimes like, so that is one concept for gravity retaining walls. Next thing is a, a reinforced concrete types in which you have, you know, when uh, bending and um, uh, bending develops, you know, so you try to put some sort of you, this is a reinforced uh, uh, concrete wall in which uh, because of the you try to understand the bending moments developed and uh, try to provide the steel to withstand the uh, bending and all that and try to have a suitable uh, design methodology for that which is well established. So you have essentially by the you try to uh, um, resist the pressures by this cantilever action here. And we also have what you call the buttress and counterfoot retaining wall in which you try to provide, you know, when you want to reduce the thicknesses, you know, the thing is that what happens is that the base width of this uh, wall and there are certain proportions in our uh, um, retaining wall literature in which you, may, you must have some sort of uh, dimensions here, some dimensions here, some dimensions here. And then when the height is beyond 7 meters or 8 meters, the possibility is that this widths become uh, little bigger. So, we try to provide some sort of counterfoots here which will see that the uh, concrete areas are reduced, the quantities of concrete are reduced in the system. The other one that we have in retaining walls is that uh, you try to uh, compartmentalize the systems like you know in, in the form of a bin or a, you know, you try to this is a system in which you can place all these materials and it is like uh, it acts as like a confined material. Uh, in a confined material, uh, that though there is a pressure from all the sides, this uh, confinement that we have, it takes care of the uh, pressures developed. So, that way it is a simple system that we have. In fact, uh, this has been used uh, effectively in some of the flyovers uh, in Bangalore, which is very cost effective. And uh, the final one was that what we would be talking today is the reinforced earth walls in which you have a facing element, you have a geocentric uh, reinforcement and you have a uh, backfill. So, this we call it uh, see in, in, uh, in there are two types here one is uh, actually mechanically stabilized earth walls we call it MSC with metal reinforcement one can have metal reinforcement otherwise you can also have geogrid reinforcement or a geocentric reinforcement or whatever. So, uh, these are the categories and uh, this is a way that it looks like that you have a reinforced soil and then you have retaining wall or a foundation soil and you have different elements here, you have a segment, this is all called actually this type of wall is called segmental retaining wall in which uh, you have a, a you know this is called segmental facing, we will see that uh, what is the difference, you, you can have a full, there are different types of facing, one one can have as you just mentioned earlier, this retaining uh, the reinforced uh, elements are designed to take care of the lateral pressures, once you know what should be the length and the spacing of that. Uh, we have seen this idea in the reinforced soil slopes and once you know this design comfortably then whatever you get here the pressures are somewhat going to be minimals, minimum and we try to provide some sort of segmental facing types, it can be full facing or it can be even concrete panels that what we see in most of the flyover projects in India 
and we also have what you call a shear key or a mechanical connector between the two uh, facing elements and then this is a geocentric reinforcement and uh, geo, you have a geotextile uh, drain here and you have a granular leveling pad and all that. So, this is a simple way of uh, re reinforced uh, retaining wall system. Uh, we will see its design and how it can be constructed in the field and all that in this lecture and the coming lecture also. Um, as I just mentioned, Vidal is one person who developed this uh, technique and uh, when he developed this technique, he had this uh, uh, precast concrete panels then this is a backfill, this is actually backfill, this we call it a uh, wall fill, wall fill means this is a reinforced soil wall. So, whatever you are trying to use it as a wall fill uh, because it should have good friction, right? good friction should be there and uh, that is what we call it the reinforced earth. In fact, uh, the same company has been continuing and then constructed a lot of reinforced earth walls in abroad in India and it has been quite a uh, very useful technique. And you can have steel strips as a reinforcement, you can have geotextile materials, you can have you know uh, the conventional geotextiles can be you know it can be nano ones, ovens, knitted, stretch bonded, many types of materials that we saw earlier can be used as a reinforcement material. Sometimes even geotextiles, speci uh, special geotextiles like say for example, geocomposites like as I said when uh, the pore pressures are going to be higher or if the clay is somewhat uh, uh, poor quality, we can use a uh, geocomposite in which you have a uh, reinforcement as well as a drainage material attached to it. So, the reinforcement is uh, good enough to take care of the lateral pressures and the uh, drainage action of the geocomposite helps in draining the backfill. Uh, what are the principal requirements of the reinforcement? Uh, we have seen that strength of the reinforcement, in fact we did uh, calculations on uh, slope stability and other things, strength of the geotextile or the geogrid is important and its stability like it should not creep too much. Of course, the polymeric materials do creep and um, this strength and stability are important, then durability like how long you know because you are trying to design for 100 years or 50 years or whatever. Then ease of handling reinforcement should be able to you should be able to handle in a very easy manner like you know you can bring them to a, in a lorry or you know in some sort of containers and put them on the field. Very importantly high coefficient of friction or the adherence with the soil like you know we need good friction between the soil and reinforcement that is very important because that is a whole concept of reinforced soil. Now, it should have low cost also like you know why are you using this you need to have you know uh, apart from technical advantages like we say that we can increase the uh, uh, width of this uh, reinforced uh, concrete uh, uh, you know the thickness of the uh, stem and all that in the case of uh, reinforced uh, concrete retaining walls you can say that. But we essentially want low cost readily available readily availability you know ready availability is something very important why because uh, it should be done faster it should be co comfortable in the way that it can influence the whole system. So, the whole construction should be uh, uh, faster you know. The, so, we, we saw that advantage of the reinforced soil earlier, it should be able to come contribute, should have this some of this uh, principal requirements and uh, see that it serves the intended function. So, it should have among them the important properties as I just mentioned tensile strength like say for example, there is so much air pressure that is developed with some spacing and uh, length of the reinforcement we get this uh, tensile strength like uh, that is one thing we will see that tensile modulus is very important because if there is a deformation you know movement is very important and uh, the reinforced soil walls also deform and uh, tense the modulus of uh, deformation like uh, the tens when you get what you get from tensile strength is very important and the third one is interface shear strength is also very important these three components are very important um, in the design. So, how do you go about design particularly when you are trying to use uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the reinforced uh, soil uh, technique in this is something that we use a limit equilibrium approach. We need to look for stability, external stability, internal stability and the properties of the backfill will be the uh, friction angle at constant volumes phi and c you know this shear strength parameters should be obtained corresponding to large strains. 
this is what we saw in uh, reinforced slopes also that we try to conduct uh, say direct shear test or a track cell test say for example bedded track cell test in which you get uh, c and phi parameters for uh, uh, effective stress parameters and for say for example 3 or 4 normal stresses and then you get uh, c phi from this uh, large strains essentially cv means constant volume strains and design strength of the geogrids is what we have seen that the company gives some uh, property say for example we have seen one example where you can say it's uh, 50 kilo newton per meter and then you have various factors like uh, the uh, partial factors like fm the manufacturing constant environmental factor damage factor and all that okay all these factors are there one can use and then finally you should just use this as a design strength okay so what are the external stability considerations these are all you know standard even for regular retaining walls we know that we design the retaining walls for bearing over turning and sliding and deep strip, deep stability like a retaining wall whether it is a reinforced earth wall or uh, uh, any other like uh, conventional retaining wall it should not slide right that's one thing so sliding resistance is important over turning is also important then bearing capacity failure should not occur say for example it has some it will uh, once you construct a stru structure like this the, since there is nothing here there is some sort of uh, pressures and moments that get developed and uh, the pressure bearing pressure should be satisfactory here deep seated uh, stability like you may construct a retaining wall but it should not uh, it should not be in a slip circle you know if this is a you try you should construct uh, you know you should really do a, some sort of analysis in which wherever you are going to place a reinforced earth wall the area should not lead to some stability like issue like this global global stability we call it so all these things have to be satisfied uh, in fact uh, to to design the reinforced earth walls we have two methods one is called tie back wedge method i will just explain what it is and uh, say we what tie means a tension member and then this is a wedge that is forming right so you try to put a reinforcement like a tie member and then keep the wedge back in position so that is why we call it tie back wedge method and uh, the assumptions some of the uh, things are that like you have a, uh, a rotation is about this thing and the air pressure distribution is like this it's like 45 minus 5 by 2 is a um, act failure zone like this is the failure zone at which uh, uh, the failure surface and uh, this uh, essentially we assume that the wall is cohesionless and uh, it rotates about this and the earth pressure uh, variation no, we assume that it is the same everywhere like we assume at active earth pressure conditions okay we active earth pressure conditions we assume and uh, because uh, the there are two conditions state of we uh, the, in the beginning I said yet the state of uh, soil is it a K naught condition or a K condition like is it the coefficient of earth pressure trust is there or is it for the active earth pressure we should design is something very important so uh, this material like you know you put a geotextile say for example what you are trying to do is that we later will put some geotextiles here and then there will be some deformation uh, so because of which there will be an active condition so we assume that the variation earth pressure is constant and uh, the earth pressure lateral earth pressure diagram will be like this you know earth pressure diagram in terms of uh, this thing this is just a ka constant this is ka gamma h right ka gamma h is the pressure and now you have a surcharge also ws so plus you add you know so this is the actually the earth pressure at any point due to its uh, with uh, its variation with depth as well as due to the surcharge as well this is called tie back wedge method you have another method which is something which uh, people have uh, you know based on observations of many of the re walls you know uh, they have observed that you can you know earth pressure if it really measure it will not be you know an active condition it will be in a k naught condition for some uh, about at least 5 to 6 years and uh, based on that in fact uh, see they, they say that in fact k naught they just put here you can see k naught into uh, that uh, is one thing k naught will be it is about 6 meters up to say for example if you are trying to measure small high uh, retaining walls like 3 meters or 4 meters if you measure at pressure it will be k naught 
like I have measured. In fact, in one of the cases in uh, Delhi, uh, it is about uh, 7 or 8 meters, but uh, I was me measuring with depth at some points. The air pressure was K naught, you know, we, are, we have a uh, measurement of uh, by using some diaphragm and all that. There is a method of measuring air pressures. We I used it and found that the air pressure is uh, corresponding to K naught condition, like which means that soil has not moved, like there is no uh, lateral strain is 0, that is what the point is. So, when you have that, so then, so K naught is always 1 minus sin phi and K A is 1 minus sin phi by 1 plus sin phi. So, as the height is increased, it will become K naught to K A, it will decrease actually. Okay? So, for example, if the wall height is 8 meters, so it will be this. So, you have to assume a distribution diagram like this, okay? at pressure distribution diagram like this and the same thing also here, like uh, there the, uh, the difference is only that you have the uh, other one uh, superimposed on this. So, this is as, uh, the coherent gravity method is what it means is that uh, people have observed that many of the retaining walls of particularly smaller heights are uh, having a state of rest and then the uh, even the failure diagram in fact people have measured you know how do you measure their pressure diagram in fact you can monitor the tensile strains in the reinforcement instead of the 45 minus 5 by 2 that what we have seen uh, this is the air pressure the failure zone that they have taken in fact uh, even if you just do a finite element analysis it comes like this it is this point you know like in the previous case it is like this you know so whereas you are just cutting it here only what it means is that now the advantage is that air pressure that you have to consider in design is much less in the previous in the next in the uh, coherent gravity method compared to this case here you are trying to consider all this pressure whereas in the next in this case the air pressure is only like this which is which means that this method is somewhat economical is it not? We are trying to make this, uh, if you make based on the observations, this is a method that was used, developed by you know um, some group of people in uh, France and particularly it is valid for steel reinforcement, you know, because they are initially working for steel reinforcement and steel reinforcement is stiffer, we have seen that. And um, whereas a geotextile is a flexible reinforcement, it, ne it needs some strain. So, I cannot assume this sort of a uh, distribution, I should only go for the previous distribution. In this distribution, what people have observed is that this is just the, so it also rotates about this point, not in the other case it was somewhat reverse, like you can see in the previous case, it is the rotation is about the toe, whereas here the uh, rotation is at the top. So, that is what the assumption that they have and this is, they have measured actually, they have measured the air pressures and then uh, even measured the strains. Like you know, you can place, uh, you know, you can measure the strain along the reinforcement, entire length of the reinforcement, and uh, uh, in this zone, what happens is that the uh, if this is the lateral force acting, the tensile strains direction will be in the opposite direction. Okay, the strain measurements they will be like this, and uh, beyond the failure point, the uh, they try to hold it. Okay, the uh, direction of strains would be different on both sides. So. Uh, Direction of the based on that uh, actually shear stress distribution along this uh, reinforcement, you know, because this is a shear stress uh, mobilization, right? Shear stress mobilization along the uh, reinforcement. Based on that, uh, you can locate this uh, uh, actual uh, failure surface because at this point, uh, you know, the they'll beyond you know this point will constitute uh, 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 one location where the shear strain uh, that uh, distribution will be different on either side, you know. So, that is what you know the thing is that what it means is that uh, you can construct this uh, like you know you what people have done is using finite element analysis also or using uh, uh, experiments also people have measured using centrifuge you can put reinforcement and measured its tensile strains. So, at this point actually the point at which it is maximum you know we have seen one uh, even in the, in the Binkwitley method also they assume some maximum uh, strain distribution and uh, we we made some assumptions there similar to that we have uh, the location of um, strains here so it will be like that right so you construct this particular line and based on their observations they followed uh, they observed that 
for a h by 2 distance it is about tan inverse 0 0.6, 0 0.6 and another h by 2 the height of that it will be straight line and uh, this particular thing is 0.3 h. So, actually this is uh, the line of maximum tension reinforcement. So, if you observe for all the reinforcement elements where is the maximum tension and then locate them and join them you know the, uh, the actually you know that uh, there is a you can find out the distribution of uh, tension on the reinforcement. So, as uh, friction develops along this there will be a, a strain mobilization and then all these points you can join even in the flak or uh, plexus analysis you can get that. So, this is one important method that uh, one should understand. So, these two are uh, uh, some design philosophies that uh, people have and uh, another important thing that is that okay, you have seen that um, the there are three uh, different ways of assessing the external stability we just saw the uh, pictorially the diagram and how do you really calculate that we will see that. So, for example, this is the earth pressure diagram that we have to consider like half k a b gamma h square half k a b like 0.5 gamma k a active because this is for a geotextile ok and what I am telling is a geotextile. So, half k a gamma h square and then this is h by 3 we assume and then this is the such the other one is w s is what uh, uh, other one. So, you have to um, like the other important thing is that the bearing for the bearing pressure we assume that uh, there are two types of air pressure distribution the uh, distributions of uh, pressure contact pressure actually. Uh, you know that we have a trapezoidal footing trapezoidal distribution you know where you have a maximum tension developed and then the minimum tension developed and we have that uh, uh, b by 6 rule right b by 6 rule we have. So, that b by 6 rule is very important and here also similar thing we measure and uh, that is called trapezoidal distribution that is valid for stiff footings I mean uh, rigid footings like uh, concrete uh, footings and all that. And whereas, uh, this is since reinforced soil is a flexible structure and uh, you will not have the development of uh, maximum pressure and minimum pressure it gets adjusted in such a manner that if L is the length of the foundation like an RE wall length is about L uh, over a distance L minus 2 e it gets adjusted ok sigma v is what you get. And uh, so, instead of a trapezoidal you can have trapezoidal is one type of distribution you can assume and this is called Meerhof distribution ok. Uh, in trapezoidal distribution we assume that uh, you have a maximum value you have a minimum value and the distribution varies in the form of a uh, at the para the trapezoid, but then uh, that is valid in the case of uh, rigid foundations, but reinforced soil being a flexible structure what happens is that any pressure gets redistributed and uh, you will have only constant value. So, that is the maximum value sigma v you get and uh, uh, this is ok this is a usual thing. So, this is one another important thing it is called Meerhof distribution. So, how do you get this uh, factors of safety like we have seen that for sliding there is a sliding force which is because of k a b gamma h square by 2 and the surcharge and all that that you just put here. Resisting force is nothing but the weight of the that uh, 2 at the bottom comes here. So, 2 into mu is nothing but uh, the mu is nothing but the coefficient of friction on the base soil of the reinforced soil and it is the total resisting force you know gamma w into height plus w s is a total resisting force right. So, the fact of so you try to calculate this and the factor of safety has to be 2 right this is one thing. Now, even the uh, for the overturning you have to calculate uh, resisting moment and also the water overturning moments. So, this is actually you should know the base of that like one third where it tracks and all that and then you these are all expressions actually details are you can simply derive these equations which are straightforward considering the equilibrium of forces and the factor of safety should be somewhat says 2 or something and most of the cases it is a sliding that governs the design. So, in this case overturning is not a serious issue if you are able to satisfy the stability issue uh, the sliding stability issue automatically this gets sorted out. Then bearing pressure, bearing pressure is that you know I just showed you about I told you about the two types of distribution one is called trapezoidal distribution you can do that also and also you can do Meerhof distribution which is nothing but 
like uh, there is a simple expression that one can get based on the moments and the forces acting on the at the you know uh, at that um, below the foundation you will get a simple expression one can derive this con considering the weights and all that and uh, earth pressure coefficients the maximum pressure will be this and uh, from Meerhof distribution even you can get uh, from uh, uh, trapezoidal distribution also we know how to get maximum pressure and minimum pressure. So, uh, actually that uh, this pressure whatever pressure should be uh, the uh, less than the bearing pressure of the soil that is what is very important whatever is the pressure that is created because of the uh, this pressure should be less than the bearing capacity of the soil. So, usually an allowable bearing pressure of half the ultimate uh, is uh, taken ultimate pressure is taken. So, we no normally have a factor of safety of uh, 2 normally you can see that uh, bearing, cap cap uh, bearing capacity calculations we know and we calculate say for example, 200 kPa is the bearing pressure of the soil and if this pressure is say 150 it is all right like that right. Then we have to say as I said we are looking at all this uh, global stability issues we should look for you may construct a retaining wall, but it should not be located in a slip surface. So, all potential slip surfaces should be investigated and the target factor of safety 1.5 is used in this case that is what you saw was external stability. Then what is internal stability like now you have introduced a reinforcement. So, it should not fail by tension or it should not come by pull out it should not just come out uh, like a pull out or it should not fail by tension like this is a tension failure where there is a clear breakage where this uh, tank pull out you know reinforcement just comes out this pull out. For that we have a method how do you calculate this tension failure and all that you will see that this is a diagram you know there is a surcharge acting and you take a, a particular uh, reinforcement that is located at a distance hi and this is what I said is a actually the uh, Meerhof distribution type you know the pressure actually the uh, foundation pressure acts here right. You can assume that the same pressure acts this is for the maximum height if the height of the wall is h and uh, this is the maximum pressure that acts here uh, and then as we go up the pressure comes down. So, this at any level h i you can always calculate the uh, vertical pressure acting total vertical pressure and uh, for that you you are actually calculating uh, horizontal force you put k a times uh, vertical pressure you will get the lateral pressure and and then design for ti <coughs> what we say is that at this vi you know vi is a horizontal space we assume that at this ith level which is at uh, at a uh, distance from the top hi and vi is a spacing you know the reinforcement is effective uh, it can take care of uh, the uh, you know it can provide force within that spacing right. So, how do you calculate that uh, reinforcement force it is actually sigma vi you calculate and uh, sigma 1 then k a times the sigma v we will get that that we will see that ok. So, the grids carry tension as a result of the self weight of the fill and the surcharge acting on the top of the block that is what why that is what we did like this is what I said you know this is actually if you have seen the previous uh, figure yeah we have seen the expression for you know this is nothing but the vertical pressure into k a times ok. And actually we if the soil has cohesion we use introduce cohesion term also otherwise it is not required and uh, this acts over a distance v i ok. T is nothing but it is like k a times into this uh, vertical pressure minus this actually whatever is uh, this thing and then into v i you know as I said it acts over a distance v i. The T i is nothing but uh, it acts over this distance you know uh, this area which is with the spacing v i ok this is how we have this equation. So, what we do is that we calculate uh, for different uh, reinforcement types you know like uh, I will uh, just show you that yeah this is an expression 
and uh, we'll see uh, the uh, different you will have as a higher as you you can calculate this as you go down the spacing has to be little higher and depending on the type of reinforcement you can uh, develop this sort of curves like as i said uh, so this is the vi spacing uh, you can have different vi's and also the depth actually hi is here okay hi is everything is known here and once based on this you can calculate uh, the ti required or otherwise we know what type of reinforcement materials i have you know yeah i have say for example in this case 55 grade and 80 grade i can construct back uh, what should be the spacing if i have this sort of reinforcement at different depths is what is uh, given by this equation so this is that say for example 40 grade 40 grade i don't want to use but i can say that 40 divided by all the partial factors right so maybe you will get some 20 number or 15 number here 15 in 15 is equal to this and then you have the only variable you assume this as c equal to 0 so this term vanishes and all the terms are known and only unknown is so you put different values of vi right it can be from 1 meter to 0.5 meters to 0.3 meters and all that you will get a diagram like this 0 0.3 0 0.4 0 0.5 like this and then you can get a diagram like this so it is called spacing versus depth diagram and uh, this will help us to we will see how it helps us in calculating a spacing okay okay that is one thing we know how to calculate now some you know you know the reinforcement and uh, particularly in the case of geo grid say for example some grid of geo grid is available you know how to work back what should be the spacing uh, uh, that needs to be provided so that uh, that uh, spacing in that spacing the lateral pressure is uh, really handled properly or taken care of then once you provide this uh, uh, reinforcement we have some more considerations like it should not fail so we have to calculate tension uh, using the wedge pull out failure also consider the possibility of failure planes passing through the wall and uh, forming unstable wedges we try to have a number of wedges like this and uh, what we do is that so for example in this case you have in this wedge of uh, this particular thing you have one two three four five six layers of reinforcement here like one one so you have six layers of reinforcement and uh, that they have to be in the position that wedge should be stable which means that the sum of all these tension forces in the reinforcement should be such that it is stable like the t should be equal to the uh, you know it is a, a component of this weight okay which you can get from in fact i will show you that it can be you know, from uh, graphics uh, element uh, that we have we know the basics of graphics uh, engineering graphics one can get that you know from what is called polygon force polygon you can get that okay i will see that like you know if you know the uh, weight acting you know the horizontal actually this is a horizontal force acting you know imagine that there is a curvature and there is a vehicle goes like this there is a, com a component of f1 that is acting there is a vertical load acting so it's like a a retaining ball and a flyover you know, imagine that okay so what we should so we are trying to take a wedge here with an angle beta and then there is a because of the weights acting w and all that there is a resultant is a force resultant you have a resultant which has a an angle theta phi w with this and then you have a theta uh, tension force t which will be required to keep all these things in equilibrium that's what we try to find out what we do is that we have to we will make some assumptions uh, we each wedge behaves as a rigid body friction between the facing and the fills is ignored we investigate a series, series of wedges as shown below like you know, we take a number of wedge failure uh, considerations here like you know see even very important is that see say for example you have so much reinforcements 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 you have all 1 2 they are all so in this wedge if I are trying to look at this wedge uh, stability, I should see that there should be the tensile force should be so much that this wedge should be in under stable conditions. That is what we will investigate in a series of wedges. This is what we do. I said the first polygon, right? You can see here, and uh, these are all the forces that can act. And uh, for a simple case of uh, only surcharge acting, and uh, 
you can simple expression can be derived you know this is just based on force polygon you can calculate this expression imagine that uh, you know, re resolving into vertical forces and horizontal forces in the direction of uh, you know appropriately you can do that so for simple at any level by changing beta you know what we do is that we investigate this uh, t max for different uh, betas like as i just showed my in my previous diagram betas can be vary from there are so many betas here so then there could be many betas here so all that betas we investigate is a simple uh, uh, simple excel program one can write uh, to have all this information and then uh, plot like this okay and then once you plot that you will have the maximum value so you take the maximum value as the uh, tensile force required to keep all the wedges in equilibrium that is what is required it is a very simple case where you try to calculate the maximum tensile force required to keep all the wedge the you know all the so that the wedge failure do not, will not occur that is a principle here like all these wedges are all contained you know put in this uh, form right okay. So, in fact, for a simple uh, case where there is only a surcharge, you know, one can, uh, it is a simple equation you will get. T, t is nothing but h tan beta into gamma h and uh, if you, h is the maximum, uh, you know, say for example, height, height of the returning wall is say 7 meters, I put 7 meters here and uh, surcharge I know. Surcharge is nothing but say for example, 20 kPa as per IRC or 22 kPa or whatever. So, you can put that number, you will get the maximum tensile force required in the, uh, is actually total reinforcement force, total reinforcement force required, we will see that, okay. Uh, so, now the other important thing is that the wedge pull out failure, you know, it is also a function of the overburden, right. The thing is that the, this is all that overburden pressure and whatever is that uh, you know there should be sufficient length beyond the failure zone actually if this is a failure surface that we assume and uh, there should be enough length to see that uh, the tensile failure you know we have seen a factor of safety you know the tensile force we calculate and the pull out resistance also we calculate there should be adequate uh, factor of safety there otherwise i mean the pull out resistance should be higher than the tensile force mobilized maybe two times okay uh, this is another one that uh, one can have, you know. Uh, so, what is the anchorage force you can develop, you will get is also given by, you know, actually that length that you have, you have, you know, the length, this is called the anchorage uh, length, you know, that length at any point one can calculate and that is given by this expression and uh, the anchorage force or the pull out resistance. Well, there are two terms one is one is called a tensile resistance tensile force mobilized in the reinforcement now you have to calculate the anchorage force anchorage force means pull out resistance so that is nothing the nothing but it is a function of the length of the uh, reinforcement below the beyond the failure zone and also there is a coefficient alpha then tan phi w on to depends on the surcharge also for each layer of the reinforcement cut by the wedge, the lower of the design values T design or the T A uh, is used to determine the contribution from reinforcement. So, what we do is that we we calculate whichever is lower and then come we try to uh, then again compare the mobilizing force to the resisting force. We have to see that uh, we make all these calculations of uh, say what I said earlier previous section was that. You calculate the, you know, this is in terms of the again the wedge, uh, wedge failure stability, and there are. Uh, this is in terms of the anchorage, okay, and the previous case was in terms of the tension, okay. So, what we try to see is that all the forces we try to compare and see that the sum of all the forces should be more than or equal to the uh, total tension mobilized. The total tension is nothing but the total of tensile force required for the wedge stability, right? So this is we will see that in an example that you will get much more uh, clarity on that. And this is a typical case of a GRS wall constructed with a face, uh, you know, uh, like a, a pre precast concrete uh, facing, and you have a wrapped geotextile. Also, one can have you know there are many types of facings are possible. So, 
there are a uh, number of design methods. In fact, uh, uh, as I said, GRS walls have been very useful and they, are, they have been very cost effective. And uh, so, there are uh, design approaches that are developed and uh, we, uh, essentially there are two design methods that we follow. Actually, rank n approach is one thing like 1 minus n phi in that type of approach we use. And uh, we have a federal highway approach which is by you know one uh, standard code. Then we have NCMA approach another one and we also have BS8006 UK code. These are all from UK, US actually and then you have a US code BS8006 is another standard code and uh, many of most of the codes in the world they follow many of these codes and then uh, sometimes they follow in, the, in uh, different countries they have their own codes also. So, before I go, go further I want to illustrate a few more points here that uh, as I said uh, facing is can be anything. So, people have tried different uh, facing blocks because uh, people these are all very simple actually you know they one can carry it with hand like if you are familiar with uh, some uh, wall structures that are constructed you know in the concrete panel that we have you know it needs a lot of cranes and all that and all. here you do not need cranes you know you just have a simple uh, equipment and also the a simple company that manufactures this type of uh, uh, facing blocks. It is called segmental retaining wall units like they are quite useful like you know, these are all facing blocks you can see that you know you can construct like this simple uh, facing like this is a typical example that we have seen in many places in India some places at least these are facing you know it is called segmental wall design is another type. So, you, you the advantage is that it is easy to construct the you can have a nice finish and uh, the it is also cheaper that is one thing because the overheads you know because of the uh, high heavy equipment are not there. This is another type you can see simply blocks only are kept compared to a panel of 1.2 or 3 meters you know the panel will be 1 meter to 1.2 meters it depends you know. So, this is also another one. This is another one you can just see many types of structures one can have. So, the way that we construct is that it is uh, like uh, these are all simple blocks they can be handled and uh, this way it is you know, shear key as I just mentioned and this is another one you know the type of thing we have. So, this is how it is done ok. So, very importantly uh, actually the problem the, there is a uh, your since you are putting uh, face, fascia blocks one should understand that uh, it can they can fail also like it is it is not easy to simply stack one over the other. So, like a t similar to regular retaining walls you should do for base sliding overturning and bearing capacity calculations internal uh, stability calculations pull out tensile resistance internal sliding particularly like this. I have seen a couple of failures like this because we think that simple construction is easy, but it is not easy. Then facing there could be a connection failures, there could be column you know it, it uh, fails as a column here you know it does there is no integrate then there could be some toppling failures many things are possible. So, one though the facing uh, uh, looks very impressive uh, one should be very careful because uh, one should look at all these possibilities. So, this is what I just mentioned like uh, the it can fail and all that this is another type failure. So, this is a column shear failure toppling people yeah, we have seen many cases in India actually because uh, what they do ok this is all simple precast block. So, I can get from flash they try to do a poor quality then the possibility is that it can lead to failure ok. So, this is a simple example of global stability like you know you have to investigate uh, maybe this is a nice uh, say for example, this is a typical uh, uh, what is called segment segmental wall what is called modular concrete blocks you can have it. This is a reinforcement layers ok and um, you have a drainage here drainage pipe is here and uh, geo grids are placed and this is how it is there right. I just want then you have to investigate the like you know because it is forming this part of the slope right. So, you have to investigate all the failure surfaces you can see that 1.33 1. you have all these numbers 
definitely it is more than 1.3. So, it is okay like that. So, you have to do some sort of analysis like this. So, the typical factors that we recommend are you know it could be like this you know base sliding 1.5 uh, bearing capacity tensile over stress all that you have to verify you know top link and one should calculate and do that global stability 1.3 to 1.5 in the previous case it is more than 1.3 so it is okay. So, the construction details yes the uh, this is one way this other way like this is a drainage element actually you know this is another blocking and uh, locking bar. This is a general view of the wall construction. Placing blocks, see you have a thread here running. Wall ties, fixing uh, false facing. You can have you know false facing also. This may be a actually required facing, this can be a nice facing which, whichever you want, okay. Like people have false roofing, locking geo grid between blocks, this is on one type. So, sometimes you know safety barriers on the walls at the top of the wall also should be done because once you construct the wall, people should not just uh, you know it, it should not lead to any problems. So, this is like that. So, many you know one can have a nice fencing and any things are possible like examples of finished structures, this is another one, this is a nice uh, treatment that one can give, yeah. This is I just want to show you the influence of uh, the because of the earthquake, the possibility is that you know one of the railway lines in Japan has yielded and that was reconstructed later with the wall technique ok. And uh, geogrid reinforced soil wall along the JR you know Japanese railway Kobe line, you know Kobe line is an earthquake that occurred and uh, the thing is that it is before construct before the earthquake occurred and you can see the same photo after the earthquake uh, occur, I mean after the see you can see that there is a collapse of all the structures, but Ari wall is still stable ok. So, this is another one damaged uh, mason, masonry wall reconstructed to JRS with a full height facing you know this is one masonry wall type of construction that again it got failed in the earthquake, but uh, they reconstructed with uh, you know uh, full height facing I told you know full height facing it means uh, the facing is fully there. In fact, uh, we did uh, many one is uh, full height facing is also possible like a simple facing fully put a one member no do not worry about simple blocks like that right. Uh, another example of poor quality in Bangalore this is one case where you know the it was not well done you can see that. So, you, you there is a technique is quite simple I would like to just now illustrate with you this with a simple example this is where I would like to end. We have an 8 meter high wall to be built using the sand fill and the polymer grid reinforcement the sand has a friction angle 30 degrees, bulk density is 18 meters and uh, surcharge load of 15 kPa is there and the bearing capacity is about uh, 300 kPa. You have two geo grids available grid A 20 kN per meter and uh, B equal to 40 kN per meter both have a bond coefficient of 0.9 ok these are all known. And then the fill has uh, 20 cent 250 centimeters of compaction lips you know why this uh, is required is that you compact the sample and put a geo grid. So, next one should not be you know it should be in multiples of 250 only any placement uh, should be in terms of 250 only because the thickness is important here. And the location of the geo grids you have to redesign the, say for example, you have a uh, even your facing block if you are using a modular blocks it would be 250 mm then uh, put the uh, two, uh, all heights this is a very important parameter if you decide this then uh, spacing design of your uh, uh, facing blocks all depend on that ok. As I just mentioned this is all the uh, once you know the quantities and uh, fact of safety I gave an expression for the sliding stability like if user uh, uh, previous formula that we discussed uh, to avoid uh, uh, sliding stability the factor of safety of minimum is 2. So, use that number and all the quantities like K A B height and uh, surcharge everything is known 
you substitute back in the equation the minimum length required is about 5.83 meters so you can take 6 meters the height of the wall is 8 meters and uh, 6 by 8 is 75 percent so 7.75 is the length of the 0.75 l is the length of the reinforcement okay actually uh, this is very important you know this was sliding uh, stability is taken care similarly you can do the overturning stability like you know you can put all these numbers it is actually given in my book also this particular examples and the factor of safety with respect to overturning is you know if you just put all the numbers it's 4.26 okay more than 2 now using trapezoidal distribution you calculate you know you i said you can do meyerhoff distribution or even trapezoidal distribution and uh, use for example in this case i would like to show the use of uh, trapezoidal distribution one can uh, see that and you get maximum vertical stress as 271 kpa which is less than the bearing capacity of the soil and uh, minimum values 159 maximum minimum values it's more than 0 uh, which means that there is no tension developed actually if you are using uh, why use why use this uh, trapezoidal distribution is that uh, we would like to satisfy the no tension criteria also but remember the reinforced soil is uh, foundation is a flexible structure so we better use a meyerhoff distribution that leads to actually if you use a meyerhoff distribution the, this value may will be much lower so will be instead of telling you telling that it's 271 is less than 300 kpa this value will be much less, lesser because there is a readjustment and this sigma v minimum will be zero it will also come down because there is a readjustment now as i just mentioned how do you calculate the tensile forces right this is that uh, horizontal force into sv is a spacing right and uh, this is say for example you assume a spacing of uh, sv and this is a horizontal force this is a tensile force required to keep that uh, place in position ka this is what the, this thing and sigma v is nothing but uh, this formula is there right so you substitute all the quantities and then uh, you know put in terms of the sv like you know see the ti is nothing but the design strength values like you know i just have two geo grid materials and uh, their design strengths i know like 20 and 40 like in the previous example i in the statement of the problem i just mentioned the two grids of uh, di different design strengths are available g, g grid at 40 and uh, 20 and 40 okay this point 9 are available this we should remember okay so you put it here uh, using the say so you are putting it here that number and then try to just put this sort of equation and you will get a grid like this grid da grid b you just get depending on the spacing and all that you will get some sort of simple diagram like this and uh, actually we are only going for space close spacings only what it means is that uh, if you are using a geo grid of a you know which is somewhat uh, weaker compared to this you know 40 km is bigger right stronger so you can have 0.25 spacing right up to then you know up to a depth of about uh, this this much length so here grid a you know 20 kilo newton 20 kilo uh, newton per meter you can just it starts with uh, you know uh, you have to go for lesser than which is not possible here so what it means is that uh, grid a you cannot use bottom at the bottom because it's less than 0.25 it is going here so i can start using this 0.25 only from here at uh, 6 point uh, between 5 and 6 so you say 5.5 that's what it means okay so once you do this then this helps you know in that fashion so one can construct a, 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 a you know point for you know just put in a simple excel program and then get this uh, this thing and plot like this you will get that information but essentially we are going for this uh, case and uh, wedge stability check also can be done and we can uh, trial wedges can be done and uh, calculate the total required force this is one thing i just mentioned and you have to calculate checks with and without surcharge and as just mentioned there is an equation for a critical angle that you have and this is an expression that we have and uh, for any uh, reinforcing layer at depth jet below the top of the wall the polar resistance is given by this number so this is uh, you know behind the retaining wall uh, the behind the failure zone or the you know in the 
anchorage length we call it you cal calculate the passive resistance. So, you get all this information and uh, what we do is that we try to make all these calculations and uh, say for example, this is a diagram that I would like to show here. Uh, wedge depth you have wedges at different depths 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 meters and force to be resisted total force that you have to resist will be uh, if it is 0 surcharge is 8 and if it surcharge is 3. So, you calculate all these numbers this is all the force to be resisted by the members. Then you know the geo grids you know like you know I just mentioned you have to just put some numbers here in the sense that uh, so if I have two uh, two geo grids we have A and B and you have A J A geo grid is uh, 20 kilo newtons so you put 2 40 and this is one number and pull out resistance is we have an equation that I just mentioned pull out resistance you are getting you know with and without surcharge you calculate without surcharge uh, pull out resistance is uh, 42 with surcharge is this and uh, whatever is minimum say for example, you have to take here right and then see that whatever is available ok. See the that you have to compare you know both of them you have to compare available force uh, minimum of uh, P D and P P ok 40 ok. So, here it is 80 ok. So, all, all these things we maintain and uh, see that this is now this is this is the minimum this is what is uh, we have and uh, the design strength you compare actually ok. So, they have to be more than that you know any stage like uh, yeah, pull out resistance have to be higher. This uh, pull out resistance have to be higher. So, for example, the at 0 can WS equal to 0. Say so this is 5639 is a pull out resistance available, the design tensile force is 700. So, that is what uh, we see that it all the time the design requirement is satisfied here in terms of the tensile forces and the force to be resisted. Say for example, here uh, 192 you can get from this combination only 15 into 20 plus 10 into B, 10 B is 40. So, that comes to totally 700 and uh, that 700 will uh, be higher than this you know this is uh, this two is higher. So, essentially one, one needs to formulate a, uh, a sort of a uh, the you know evaluate like this and in fact there are many software available on uh, to calculate in fact uh, if you just do this you know this is the way that it should be provided like you know 1 meter 2 meters and all that and you know spacing can be avoided and uh, de design spacing uh, it should be 0.25 it should start here and then with uh, you can have spacing and length is the L is the length of reinforcement. So, one should be able to design a suitable reinforcement layout and there are many number of software that are available they can they are company specific they are also uh, one can design systematically using an excel program and all that. So, essentially we, what we discussed so far is that yes uh, uh, some sort of a design if uh, reinforced soil uh, walls is uh, uh, possible using uh, a given type of reinforcement or you can even recommend a given type of uh, recommend or you know, check the stability of this uh, reinforced walls considering internal stability as well as external stability and all that and with this I will conclude. Thank you.